the, the, the leadership of the Democratic Party decided at some point in the, in the 1980s that, that, that continuing to fight the old fight, the old Roosevelt battle, uh, the old, you know, the, the, what the Democrats had been identified with ever since the 1930s of fighting for good wages, fighting for an equitable distribution of wealth, fighting for the welfare state, that this had to go. They didn't want any part of that anymore. They were going to move on. They were going to become new Democrats. And they were going to sign off on the, on the Republican agenda on the economic issues and fight it out on the culture issues instead. And as a result, you had things like Bill Clinton signing NAFTA, uh, Bill Clinton agreeing to deregulation of the banking industry, uh, deregulation of the telecom uh, industry. Uh, and you can go right down the list, uh, you know, failing to enforce antitrust, enacting the Republican economic agenda, even while taking a hard stand on the, on the cultural issues and continuing to fight on those. Maybe millions of people really did believe that values were more important than retirement or benefits or... Well, I tell you, they... they the, the Democrats have made that choice very easy for them by failing to battle on those lines. And I'll, I'll give you a very specific example, again, drawn from the book, that uh, Wichita, again, a city that had a Democratic congressman and a Democratic mayor back in the 70s and the 80s, and that, that had a lot, it still, still does, have a lot of union members, a lot of blue-collar voters, and a lot of people who are natural Democrats, people that ought to be, ought to be, de- ought to be voting for the Democratic Party. On economic issues. On economic issues. Uh, but who also are, are good church-going people and who think abortion is wrong and this sort of thing. Uh, well, when Clinton signed NAFTA, which was, you remember, was a very, very important issue to the, to the labor movement in America and to working-class people generally, uh, when Clinton signed off on NAFTA, they, they said, you know, why are, we, why are we voting for the Democrats? They don't give us anything. They don't agree with us on anything. They don't agree with us on the economic issues or on the cultural issues. We might as well go to the party that agrees with us on the cultural issues. There was no longer a distinction on the economic issues. This has essentially values matter most because there is nothing else out there anymore. The, the Democrats don't want to fight on the economic issues anymore. You write that people getting their fundamental interests wrong is what American political life is all about. That's right. That's right. Well, I, what I was thinking of there when I wrote that was, the, again, this, 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 the great aura of a new economy, of this, uh, this beautiful free market, this perfect free market world that we're always told about, where everything works and where, you know, we're all interconnected globally and the websites, you know, and, uh, <laughs> and the fax machines purring and, and everything works. But this order is, is founded on people g- making a fundamental error. You wouldn't have this, this perfect free market system, what, is what certain people believe to be a perfect free market system. Of course, I don't feel that way. I think there's been, it's at it, 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 a terrible human cost, all this stuff has been achieved. But for some people, you know, they look out from their beautiful home and they look out from the top of their office building and the world is, this, this world makes sense to them. The, the theory that they have explains everything. The free market system works. And, you know, you can read this every day in the, in the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal. This world works. It's perfect. It's wonderful. But that world is a political construct. It wouldn't have happened without Ronald Reagan, without George W. Bush, without Bill Clinton, and without Margaret Thatcher, and without the movement that these people have, have pushed on the world. When, when Ronald Reagan took office in 1980, 25% of the private sector workforce belonged to a labor union. And that had very predictable effects on wages and benefits in America. Okay, today it's, I think, 8%. It's fallen way, way, way down. It's lower now. It's now about at the same level as it was in the 1920s, before the great unionizing drive began in the 1930s, uh, before the New Deal. We're back to that kind of level. Now, is this because people have chosen that? No, it's not. If you do any kind of poll and you ask people, uh, you know, well, first, if you ask them using the word union in the poll and you say, would you like to have a union represent you at work, about 40% of workers will say, yeah, I want that. Well, only 8% of them have it. If you ask these same people, well, would you like, and you leave out the, the word union, which is a, a you know, red flag yeah. for a lot of people. If you leave that out and you say, well, would you like to be able to bargain with your boss? Would you like to be able to, you know, to, to have some say in the way the factory or, your, or your, your workplace is run? They're like, hell yes, of course I would. Then you're up to like 90%, right? But they don't get that. It's, it's next to impossible to organize a union in America You're today. saying, you say in here the political deck is stacked against right. these 
very people you're writing about. That's right. About. To, to deny them that choice, to deny the, you know, them the ability to, to choose that option, it's off the table. And it's not off the table because people don't want it. It's off the table because we, our politics and our laws are structured and have been structured since the Reagan era to make that choice impossible or very, 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 very difficult. I'll, I'll tell you, I have friends who are, who are labor lawyers, and they'll, they'll tell you stories that just, that just make you cry. You know, Somebody tries to organize a union in their factory, and immediately they're fired. Now, it's against the law, or not even a factory, you know, in a warehouse, wherever they work, in an office, wherever they work, they're fired. It's against the law to fire somebody just because they're trying to organize a union. But the penalties for breaking that law are so tiny, so insignificant, that it deters nobody. So the answer to your question, what's the matter with Kansas? Hey, what's the matter with America? <laughs> and what is it? It's the culture war. The culture war is what's the matter with us. That we're fighting over cultural issues, fighting back and forth over cultural issues. You know, we fight over the content of Hollywood movies. We vote over the content of Hollywood movies. Congress has no effect on what they do in Hollywood. We're, we're fighting over shadow issues and ignoring the, the, the bread and butter things, the things that make, you know, that, 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 that determine the way, our, the way we lead our lives, that determine the quality of life at the most basic fundamental level. Instead, we're fighting over, you know, uh, are, are there liberals in the Yale English department? You know, stuff like that. So the issues you would like to see us fight over are wages, benefits, health care, retirement. I'm a single issue voter and my issue is the economy. We've got this huge problem. We've got this, this free market capitalism that has these terrible effects. What are we going to do about it? We don't discuss those things anymore. They aren't on the agenda. The book is What's the Matter with Kansas? Thomas Frank. Thank you very much for joining us on now. Well, thank you for having me. Mm -hmm.